The best epigenetic clock for predicting chronological age is the Horvath clock, and that's what we'll see here. On the y-axis, we've got DNA MH, or DNA methylation age, or epigenetic age, plotted against chronological age on the x-axis. And then we can see many different colored circles on this plot. This is a multi-cell and tissue clock. In terms of the Horvath correlation with chronological age, we can see that it's almost perfectly linear. As evidenced by its correlation coefficient of 0.94, we can see that the p-value is far below 0.05, and note that in this case, for a positive correlation, 1.0 is perfectly linear, so 0.94 is close to as good as it can get. So with that in mind, what's my data? So to test that, I sent blood to True Diagnostic, and if you want to measure your own Horvath epigenetic age and other epigenetic tests, discount link in the video's description. So for the most recent test that I have data, it's for the April 29th test. This was blood test number uh, three in 2024. It takes about a month for the results to come in. So here we are about a week later after getting results in this video. And in terms of the results, that's what we'll see here. So when compared with my chronological age of a bit older than 51 years, we can see that my intrinsic age or Horvath epigenetic age is 58 years, seven years older than my chronological. So this is absolutely terrible news. But I think it's important to highlight, you know, weak spots and not just focus only on, you know, where I've been successful in optimizing biomarkers. Currently, Horvath's epigenetic age is one of my weak spots. So, but note that this is just one test. As I do for all tests, all biomarker tests, it's important to have more context. And I, as I mentioned, I have 14 tests since 2022. So what does that data show? And that's what we'll see here with Horvath epigenetic age from 2022 through 2024. Now, when I first started measuring in 2022, over three tests, average Horvath epigenetic age was 55 years, still older than my chronological by six years on average. But it was better over eight, year, uh, eight tests in 2023, with an average Horvath epigenetic age of 52.8 years. Now, I don't know if that small 2.2 year reduction is because of stuff I was doing to try to reduce Horvath epigenetic age, or maybe the three tests in 2022 weren't actually representative of my Horvath epigenetic age, whereas the eight tests are closer to a true representation of a full year average. There's just no way to know. All right, and then in 2024, when including this most recent test, which looks like a giant outlier compared to the others, but nonetheless, it is what it is. My average in 2024 is currently 54.2 years over three tests. So uh, at, at best, there's basically been no change over these three, uh, this two and a half year period. But at worst, we can see that in each year, Horvath's epigenetic age, the average Horvath epigenetic age is older than my chronological. So still Horvath's epigenetic age, there is room for improvement. Now there is some reason for hope because we can see that for at least one of these tests, I was able to have a Horvath epigenetic age that was younger than my chronological. So with that in mind, what's the recipe? And more specifically, what's the plan to improve Horvath's, Horvath's epigenetic age? So for that, we'll take a look at 14 test correlations between this epigenetic clock with diet. And for those who are unfamiliar with the approach and how I look at correlations, let's just do a quick, quick run through of that. So in terms of the approach, since 2015, I've weighed all my food, everything with a food scale as shown here. And then I enter those food amounts into a at Chronometer, which is a tracking, a dietary tracking app. And if you want to use Chronometer to do the same thing, discount link in the video's description. And then I manually enter the data from Chronometer into a spreadsheet, including food intake, but also macros and micros. And then each blood test has a corresponding dietary average or average dietary intake. In other words, if there's a 50 day period in between blood tests, because I'm tracking diet every day, I can take the average of those 50 days and that lines up with the latter blood test. So each blood test has a corresponding average dietary intake. And then I can calculate correlations for diet with biomarkers. Once I got to three or four blood tests, you can do that. Once you have two blood tests, you can't look at correlations. But once you start getting to three and four and more, you can start looking at correlations. Now, granted, there may be a lot of noise in the beginning, but with this continued approach and following the correlations, eventually I believe one can get closest to the truth of what may be optimal for improving biomarkers. At least that's the approach that I've used on the channel for all the other biomarkers since 2015. So with that in mind, I looked at 105 comparisons for Horvath's epigenetic age with foods, macros, and micros, with the top half of that chart shown here. 
And note that correlations are always posted on the correlation tier on Patreon. So if you're interested in seeing the full list, uh, check it out. All right, so in terms of uh, what's on the, on the chart, the R, lo lowercase r, is the correlation coefficient. And then on the right, we've got the p-value. And note that there are six of the 105 comparisons that were statistically significant at a p-value less than 0.05. Now, as a quick aside, a criticism that I've gotten is that I should use a false discovery rate. And if you're familiar with other videos on the channel, I've used that. I'm open to using it, but it's a restrictive approach in that when considering a p-value less than 0.05, that suggests that five of the significant correlations could be false positives. In other words, five of the six on this list could just be false positives. So adding an FDR or false discovery rate can help account for that, but it's restrictive in that it may exclude potentially meaningful, meaningful or even causative correlations. So on the other hand, for the most part, I generally try to follow the unadjusted correlations, but there are situations where I do adjust models further to gain more insight. So in this case, we've got protein, total fat, saturated fat, and coconut butter that are significantly, positively, or at least nominally, based on a p-value less than 0.05, positively correlated with Horvath epigenetic age. What that suggests is that relatively higher intakes of these foods over these 14 tests is associated with or is correlated with my worst Horvath data relative to when these uh, values for these uh, nutrients or foods were at their lowest end of their range. So in terms of that range, oh, uh, before we go there, also note that salt and cloves are inversely correlated with Horvath epigenetic age. So in other words, when salt was at the higher end of my intake range, which is in the 1700 to 1800 milligrams per day range, that was significantly correlated with a younger Horvath epigenetic age. And I've taken out, I, I had taken out cloves for a couple of tests. So now I've added them back in to test this correlation to see if it has anything to do with Horvath epigenetic age. So in terms of how I translate these correlations into practice, then let's take a look at the intake range for these foods or nutrients over these 14 tests. So that's what we'll see here for protein, total fat, sat fat, and coconut butter. And I've got them color coded in green and red. So when considering that protein, total fat, sat fat, and coconut butter are positively correlated with Horvath, that suggests that when their intake is high, that may be bad for Horvath. And again, I'm not trying to imply causation, but these are correlations. On the other hand, if my intake is at the low end of my range, that suggests that my Horvath data is better based on the correlations. So to follow the correlations for test number 16, I sent test number 15 out last week, so it's obviously too late to do that. So for the next test, test number 16, I'll aim for the low end of my intake range for these four foods or nutrients, 95 grams per day for protein, around 80 grams for total fat, 18 or less for sat fat, and 8 grams or less for coconut butter to test their correlations with Horvath epigenetic age. Now, if these correlations have nothing to do with Horvath, these correlations will weaken after the next reanalysis, after the next couple of tests. And then I'll continue to follow whatever correlations pop up at the top, trying to follow as many of them as possible based on the understanding that I don't know which, if any, may impact, so I try to follow them all. All right, but it's also important to mention that if I improve one biomarker, Horvath in this case, will I mess up others? Uh, the goal isn't to just improve one thing and you know, who knows what it does to everything else. I'm trying to optimize everything simultaneously. So with that in mind, let's take a look at the net correlative score for these you know, food, total fat, S, sat fat, and coconut butter with 25 other biomarkers. And the full list for all of that data is also on Patreon, but let's take a quick look at, at, at some of those for now. So protein's net correlative score is negative five. In other words, that suggests that when protein intake is at the higher end of my range, that's, that's significantly correlated with five, a net of five biomarkers going in the wrong direction versus right in terms of how those biomarkers change during aging and their association with all-cause mortality risk. And similarly, total fat, sat fat, and coconut butter also have net negative correlations with the 25 biomarker panel that's representative of multiple organ systems. So when considering that these correlations are negative, and when considering the correlations with Horvath, if I reduce intake of these foods or nutrients, that suggests that I may be able to improve Horvath and not mess up the other biomarkers that may be impacted by protein, total fat, sat fat, and coconut butter. Whether that's true, we'll find out in subsequent tests. All right, that's all for now. If you're interested in more about my attempts to biohack aging, check us out on Patreon. And before you go, we've got a whole bunch of discount links that you may be interested in. 
including discount links for epigenetic testing, including Horvath, NED quantification, at-home metabolomics, oral microbiome composition, at-home blood testing with Cyfox Health, which includes ApoB, but also Grimage, green tea, diet tracking with Coronameter, as I mentioned earlier, or if you'd like to support the channel, you can do that with the website, Buy Me A Coffee. We've also got merch, so if you're interested in wearing the Conquer Aging or Diet Trying brand, as I've got on here, that link and all of the other links will be in the video's description. Thanks for watching. I hope that you enjoyed the video. Have a great day.